My name is Alina Sergachev, today is October 4th, 2018, and I'm interviewing Robert Chafe in St. John's, Newfoundland. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. My pleasure. First of all, can you please tell me when did you first know that you want to be an artist? Oh, <clears throat> that stretches really far back. Um, I guess the first inkling I had to be an artist, I was, uh, I was very young, I was um, 9 or 10 years old. I tell this story quite often because it's such a funny thing to think about now. But there used to be um, uh, there used to be a TV show on, TV show on in um, the late seventies, early eighties called Fame, based upon a movie, and it was about a bunch of kids going to a performing arts high school in New York City, and um, and every day they'd go and they'd do math and science and stuff, but they'd also have music class and theater and acting class and dance class. And they'd all burst, burst out in the song and dance down the street. And I just thought that was like the coolest thing. And I thought, I want to go to a place like that. I want to do that for the rest of my life. So I originally wanted to be a dancer when I was a little, little kid, nine or ten. And then uh, that kind of moved into me wanting to be a musician. Uh, and I, I come from a family that is um, that was always kind of financially stressed. Um, so there was never any money for... Uh, any kind of formal arts classes or anything like that. And also my family were kind of non-artists, you know. Um, so I, w I, I didn't have any opportunities in terms of, of taking music classes or dance classes or anything like that. And then I guess when I was in high school I got involved in theater and uh, through the theater arts um, classes that I took in high school. And, um, and I guess it was around then in my early university years that this desire, this thought that I might actually do art for a living started to percolate, but it was quite late by that point. It was, I guess, in my early 20s when I finally realized, oh, I think I might, I think I might do this for a living. You mentioned in one of the interviews that in ninth grade when a teacher wanted you to submit a oh, story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, because uh, I was just telling the story yesterday actually to a class at Mon, um, somebody asked me if I always knew that I'd end up being a writer. And uh, I was I was actually writing for a long time before I realized that I was going to be a writer. I uh, um, and I didn't want to be a writer. I never set out to be a writer. I kind of fell into it. In grade nine, I was given this class assignment. Uh, we had to write a story. I think it was about Beaumont Hamel and the Great War. And I wrote a story and submitted it to my my grade nine English teacher. And then my parents came for parent-teacher interviews, and they came home that night, and they were talking about how my English teacher was raving about this story that I had written, and that he wanted to submit it to this contest. And they had the story, like my English teacher gave them the story to read. And I was so angry, I just, I had this complete breakdown. I, I cried, and I slammed doors, and I was so upset. It felt like a, um, uh, a betrayal. It felt like... Uh, I had done this thing in private that was meant to be private and only for my English teacher. If anyone had to read it, it was only for him. And now my parents were reading I was just very, very embarrassed by it. Um, and so for th that idea of writing, um, that stuck with me for a long time. That idea of writing was that, you know. Uh, and I didn't start to think about writing again until I guess I was 19, 18 or 19. And by that point, I was I was doing a lot of acting, and I kind of wanted to be an actor, at least on an amateur level. I wanted to be an actor, and uh, and I saw a really beautiful one man show. There was a really beautiful show at the LSPU Hall here uh, called My Three Dads by John Taylor, and I saw that show, and I uh, left the theater that night feeling uh, both completely exhilarated and really depressed. I was super excited and just thrilled that I had seen such an, an amazing thing and I'm so moved by it. And uh, But I was also really kind of bummed out and depressed thinking that, oh, well, I could never do anything like that. And that stuck around for a couple of weeks and I kind of just said one day, well, you've never tried, so how do you know you can't do that? And so I decided to write a play. And uh, over the next six months or so, I wrote a one-man show for myself. And so, and, and over the next couple of years, all the plays that I ended up writing, those early plays, um, the first three or four of them, were written with the idea of me being in them. Like, I was creating work for myself as an actor. Uh, it was never the intent for that to take over. <laughs> but it did. Uh, eventually, slowly but surely, I was starting to write plays that didn't have roles in them for me anymore. I was writing myself out of my own work. 
and uh, I was starting to be afforded opportunities as a writer uh, in a way that I had never been afforded as an actor. And so the balance, like the universe kind of said, maybe you should do this, and I was kind of drawn that way. And uh, luckily, happily enough, back then, um, not that it was at all conscious, but back then uh, I was, I guess, open enough to change and, and broad sweeps of change through my life that I kind of went, okay, and I, I went with them. And 20-something years later, here I am as a writer. And when you first started, how did you learn what to do, how to write plays? Um, <clears throat> I benefited greatly from uh, my complete uh, my complete ignorance about writing. <laughs> I benefited greatly. I had no idea what I didn't know. I had no idea the vast amount of. Um, I had no idea what I didn't know. I just didn't know how complex a play was. I didn't know um, what an undertaking to sit down and write a play, to write a good play, what a, a monumental, intricate um, thought process that would be. And as a result, I just stumbled through it. And um, I guess I had a certain amount of aptitude for it, uh, naturally. Uh, but looking back at those early plays, there's precious little um, kind of uh, active thought in them. They're just they're just full gut. You know, I was just I was just writing from a place of a blind belief that I could do it. And then it's an interesting thing as you do something. The longer you do it, the more you learn, and the more you know. But the more you know, the more you realize what you don't know. Um, and so, for me as a writer, the process almost. It's a direct correlation. The more, the the longer I end up spending in my career as a writer, the longer it takes to write the plays. It's just getting longer and longer between my plays because it's taking. Because there's more fear, there's more apprehension, and there's more um, uh, of an awareness of 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 what the activity is and and, and how difficult it can be. To and my standards are higher, and. Um, all those things. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know what I was doing back then, and, and that really benefited me. And I remember, and I tell this story often, there was a bunch of us. I had the great benefit of being a part of a, a really lovely community at, at uh, Memorial. Uh, there was kind of a real bloom of people through the Mondrama group there at that time, many of whom were still working actively professionally as artists. Um, including Jill Kiley, my collaborator, Aidan Flynn, who runs the Arts and Culture Centers, Danielle Irvine, Petrina Bromley, Sean Panting. Um, these were all my colleagues, and we were all kids, you know, exploring theater. And, um, and, uh, and there was a bunch of other people as well that were writing around that time. We were all kind of writing our own things, be it sketch comedy or plays or whatever. And I always looked at them, and I thought they were much more talented than I. I always thought that their ideas were better. But the one thing that I had... Um, the one thing that I had was this kind of um, blind belief that I could finish these things and that I could make them happen. And so a lot of the people that were writing around me uh, on a page-by-page -page basis, their writing was, I think, far superior to what I was doing. But oftentimes the projects would never see through to completion. They would lose their momentum or they would lose their belief that they could actually do it. And um, and that's not to paint a picture of myself as, as somehow, uh, uh, I don't know, in any way better than them. It's more to paint a picture of, of I cannot emphasize enough, this kind of blind, blind stumbling belief that I had that uh, I could do this. I could just keep on writing and things would come together. And they did. Um, I was just reading a quote the other day from someone. Um, oh, I think it was Neil Gaiman quote. Uh, someone posted on Facebook about um, you know if you if you write something you can you can go back and fix it but you can't go back and fix nothing like you have to have words on the page in order to and so there's certain that was kind of ingrained and built in me that okay well I'll just keep writing until I have enough pages for it to be a play and then we'll try to make it better but um, yeah so I knew nothing at the beginning and then I had the great benefit of over the years um, 
not only through my colleagues that I was working with, like Jill and Danielle, who became the directors of all my plays over the years, most of my plays over the years, but also the dramaturgs that I got to work with, um, I guess through the late 1990s and on through to the rest of my career, I started falling into these opportunities um, at play development centers like Play Arts Workshop Montreal or um, the Play Arts Atlantic Resource Center. I get to go to these um, play development seminars and play development retreats. Uh, the BAM Center, it's another big one for me. Um, I get to go to these things, uh, afforded the opportunity, oftentimes, and I will say it because I was one of the few people applying from Atlantic Canada for the BAM Center, for example. And so when you have a center like that that's looking for regional representation, uh, I ended up all, all the time being the, the guy from out east. Um, and I got these opportunities, and what happened when I went to those opportunities, I got a chance to work with some really top-notch dramaturgs uh, that I, that, and that I feel like I never went to school for playwriting, but that's, that was my education, working with uh, Paula Dankert and John Morrell and Sarah Stanley, who I still work with, who's still my dramaturg. Uh, Iris Turcott, my dear friend, who passed away uh, two years ago, who was my, my uh, dramaturg for about ten years. Um, those are the people that, uh, uh, Bruce Barton, I, I don't want to forget anybody because they were all so important to me. <laughs> um, those are the people that, that really um, taught me how to write and uh, looked at what I was doing as a writer and um, saw potential for it to be better and helped me understand that it could be better and taught me and gave me the resources to make it better. Yeah, so that was my real education. And then I ended up doing, um, throughout all that, I did a, a, in the early 90s, I finished a, a BA in philosophy. Uh, that was my education. And then I went back to school uh, in 2011 and did a master's of creative writing, um, focusing on fiction, actually. So I did a little bit of playwriting with Judith Thompson, but mostly I focus on fiction. Um, so yeah, my, most of my uh, playwright education came through professional work with these tremendous dramaturgs that I got to work with. And how do you deal with anxiety and doubt in regard to your craft? How did you find the courage <laughs> to make it, you know, public? <laughs> still, I'd love to ask that question of other people. I'm, I'm still looking for that answer. I, I you know, I think it, I, uh, the one thing I've realized, it's really interesting you're asking me this question because I, um, uh, I could probably give a really pat answer, and, and, and but, but the reality is, in the last two or three years, my anxiety about my writing and my doubt about my writing is at an all-time high. Uh, out of nowhere, it just kind of struck me about two years ago. Right around the time that my, my, my friend Iris died, actually, and that, that my creative life kind of changed as a result of that. But I've been kind of, uh, uh, I'm starting to pull out of it now, I think. But uh, I've been in a cycle of... of um, uh, kind of heavy contemplation about, about what I write and the value of what I write and how I do it and how I should do it differently and um, and, and a lot of doubt and um, and during that period I was kind of reaching out to people for advice similar to the question you were just asking and uh, and one friend gave the best advice which is the sim most simple advice he said well, what are you going to do are you going to stop you 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 know you're a writer like you this is what you do for your living now so if you're gonna do it you have to do it so sit down and write sit down shut up and write <laughs> which is what I've been doing and so I'm powering through uh, the doubt and anxiety about it um, as best I can to craft these pieces and to keep moving forward um, and as a result of that uh, as a result of that because I'm powering through this doubt uh, when I do get to something that I'm happy with. Uh, it's all that much more fulfilling, of course, right? So, uh, but yeah, as I was saying earlier, the plays are becoming a little bit more difficult to write. With each one I do, they're becoming a little bit more difficult and tricky. Um, and I'm constantly learning. Every one that I do, I, I feel like I'm constantly learning, so that's good too. But um, that's an age old question. How do you deal with doubt and anxiety with regards to your work? Uh, I mean, I, I think that. My friend's advice is the best advice. You make the decision that if you're going to do it, then you have to do it. And uh, and if you can't do it, then you don't do it. You make the decision to leave the field or you do something else, uh, which I've contemplated. Uh, but I always come back to um, 
the huge benefits that art and creativity and my life in theater and, and, and this cultural community here in St. John's, the huge benefits that they've brought to my life outside of that are such that I, 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 I don't know what else I would do if I had to leave all of that. Um, it's just been such a great thing, you know. So I'm powering through. It's not very specific advice, but it's the best advice I've gotten on the subject. What do you think is the most common misconception about what you do as a playwright? Uh, that it's quick or easy. Um, that, uh, and what I mean by that is, I think that people people come to see my plays sometimes, and uh, they watch what happens on stage, and they go, "Wow, that guy is so smart. He thought of that." Um, but when the reality is that what an audience experiences on stage is the culmination of three to four to five years of, of an evolved process um, that uh, goes through multiple um, contributors, that goes through high peaks and low peaks, um, that differs so much, I can't even tell you, each of the plays that I've written are so different from the play that I started out to write. Um, and so the most common misconception when people come up to me after seeing a show of mine that they really, really like and they kind of look at me like, um, with admiration, it's very nice, look at me with a sense that what they saw was something that I thought of one day and then sat down and wrote. And the process is very different than that. Um, I set out to write something that was this big. <laughs> and then over four or five years of adding to it and discussing with people and, and challenging myself and being challenged by other people, suddenly it's a much bigger thing, much more complex, much more integrated um, form of storytelling than I would have ever conceived of on my own um, from the very beginning. And I think that I try to imply, import and um, give that to my, uh, my students as much as I can, um, that notion that because I think a lot of young writers encounter work or read a, read a novel or encounter a play and like I did all those years ago, I could never do that. Uh, and they get frustrated with themselves when they're trying to write a play that it's not as good as something they've seen in production. And I keep trying to say to them, like, no, what you're seeing in production is a result of years of work and refinement and, and uh, a writer going back and, and picking away at something and a writer kind of uh, someone from the outside, I say this all the time, someone from the outside saying to a writer, you keep talking about water and this, like, have you noticed that? And the writer would go, no, I have no idea what that's about. And they go off and suddenly they realize that the play is about water. That's not what they start to, and all that stuff is a mis mystery of how it happens, but it, it happens over time and it happens over a lot of hard work. So I think that that misconception that what you, um, that you read a novel or that you see a play and that that is the initial vision of the writer that they started out with, uh, that's a huge misconception. That is just not true for me anyway, it's just not true. And where do your plays start for you? Um, all different kinds of places, um, and that's been changing over the years as well. Uh, a lot of the plays, a lot of the plays I wrote early on were this is another thing that I did early on that a lot of people, other people didn't do and that I see a lot of my students not doing. I had the, um, when I sat down to write a play, I had the uh, initial impulse, uh, unwavering impulse to mine my own life. Like it would never have occurred to me back then to write like a murder mystery set in New Orleans. It would never have occurred to me to do that. Uh, and I get a lot of students coming through my class now that that's their first impulse is to actually write something that has nothing to do with them. They're just writing. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Um, uh, that's fine. Um, my goal then becomes to try to get these students to look at their own lives and realize that there's value and, and um, import in what, in what they have to bring to the stage. But I, I at the very beginning, I never... Um, that was that's immediately what I went to. I was writing about myself, and so I was writing about um, things in my world that felt important to me and my stages of development as a young person. And 
and then I started working with Jill. Those first couple plays were about that, and then I started working with Jill, and Jill was, um, and you've interviewed Jill previously, so you probably know this, Jill had come out of university, uh, New York University, with a real sense, as, an, as a young director, a real sense of formal experimentation. She really wanted to, um, her theater that she was creating really was about experimenting with chorus and timing and rhythm, uh, and that's what her work was. And so a lot of the work that we did together, the early work that we did together, uh, started from a root of Jill having a staging idea and saying, I want to I want to do a show with a big sheet. Can you write the script? And here's the idea. Um, <clears throat> and then we moved, you know, later the work evolved into, uh, I got a, a commission project from a, a company in Western Newfoundland that was one of my um, earliest plays about Newfoundland, I guess. I got a commission project to write about this nurse, it was a play called Tempting Providence, uh, to write about nurse Myra Bennett. And, and previous to that play, I had kind of really rejected about writing about the local because I felt like it was going to limit my potential as a writer. Like, who in Toronto would want to produce a play about Newfoundland? I thought I was wrong. Um, and so I really rejected that kind of writing. And then with the Tempting Providence and the success of Tempting Providence, that retuned my mind to the potential of looking at my community and looking at my province and my culture and the stories that might exist there. So I went on a track of that for a number of years. Um, and I feel now I'm on the cusp of something else. I was just talking about this yesterday. I feel like uh, I'll probably still all write, always write from this place and, and, and from the perspective of this place. But I feel now, uh, and maybe it's because of the political scenario that we find ourselves in or um, I'm sure it's probably definitely that, uh, but I'm finding myself more attracted to um, ideas and narratives surrounding social justice. Um, the stuff I'm thinking about is um, the stuff I'm wanting to create is um, is not necessarily rooted in um, not necessarily rooted in and kind of illuminating Newfoundland. Because for many many years, my plays, if I had to define what I was trying to do, was try to redefine Newfoundland and the world to people. And I think the next couple plays on my plate aren't really about that. They're about, um, they're smaller than that. They're about uh, individuals and identities in the world. And um, yeah, so I, I think the work is in the process of changing into something else again. Um, I've had the great, great benefit though, uh, through most of my career, which a lot of writers also don't have, had the great benefit for most of my career of having this company um, and having resources around me such that if I decide I want to write a play, regardless of what size that play is going to be, I know that it will get done. And I know there are a lot of writers in the world that write plays and then have to send them out to theaters and try to find a home for them and try to find productions. And my, my work has never had a history of that. My work is, um, you know, from the moment I have an idea or myself and Jill have an idea to create a show, uh, I know that this company will produce it three, four years down the road and that will have resources to help me workshop it and refine it. And so I'm very, very lucky that way. Um, and I say that because that has influenced uh, that has influenced the choices of the plays that I do. I very rarely, I've only f really gone down this road a couple of times and not to great success. I very, very rarely think about um, Money. I very rarely think about um, uh, like, oh, I can't write that play; it's too big, or I should write something that's more marketable, that more theaters. I I rarely think about um, the writing process for me. Very, very rarely uh, starts from a place of thinking about that end of things. I it's it's more pure kind of artistic impulse, and for that I'm deeply, deeply grateful. I feel very, very privileged to be in that position that I can. Uh, really truly write about what I want to write about. I know that it won't happen somehow. Speaking of money, how do playwrights get paid? <laughs> do they get paid? <laughs> um, so there's, there's a couple of different ways. I'm also very privileged as a writer in that I, 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 I run this company. So I, you know, part of my yearly income is actually running this company. And part of my yearly income is a little bit of teaching that I do at Memorial. Um, the playwrights that exist, and there are very few, that exist purely on their written work uh, in this country, uh, the money comes from one of two sources usually, uh, one of which is a commission, which means um, 
a producing company, so like a theater, would uh, pay a writer money to write a work for them. Um, and and that, that money would get uh, parsed out in various scenarios, but usually there'll be a, a, a chunk of money before you start to write, and then a chunk of money partway through the process, and then a chunk of money on opening night. Um, so that's one way that a writer can get paid. Uh, the second way a writer can get paid is through royalties. So writers would, uh, with their contract with a the theater, um, their contract with the theater would have a line for royalties and the standard in Canada is around 10%. So that means that all the tickets that are sold at the theater that the playwright would get 10% of the money. Um, and that may sound, depending on who you are, that may sound like very little or very uh, or a lot. Uh, and with certain theaters that can be quite a lucrative thing. Um, you know, there's uh, there are a couple of writers in this country, for example, that had one or two plays that, that really hit and there's there's one writer in this country who had a play that really hit about 15 years ago, and so they say it made him a millionaire for a couple of years. Like it, it was produced in like 40 theaters across North America, and uh, so that that's mostly how playwrights make their money. And then the development of the work um, is oftentimes uh, can be subsidized through grants, so through Canada Council for the Arts or Newfoundland through Arts NL and St. John's through the St. John's Arts Jury. Uh, you can find um, support and living stipends to actually help you get the time to write. Because a lot of writers as well are uh, have families or have actual other jobs that in order to write a play they need to get away from their job to actually do that. So those grants can provide kind of stipends and, and material costs that allow them to do that. So that's mostly how writers, playwrights, uh, put their, their careers together in order to form a living. But most of us um, have our fingers in other pies. So most of us are teachers, a lot of us are teachers as well, some of us are university teachers, a lot of us are performers, so there'll be actors as well, some film actors, um, some of us have other jobs unrelated to, um, uh, or administrators within the arts, it's part of my job, uh, and some people just have jobs outside of the arts sphere altogether, and that's what they, they do too. So it's pretty common across all writing disciplines actually. And how did you get involved with artistic uh, fraud in the first place? Yeah, I, I've been involved with the company since the very beginning. Um, contrary to popular belief, I wasn't one of the founders of the company. The company was founded in um, 1995. Jill had just graduated from New York University. And as part of her graduation project, she did this show with um, her colleague uh, Chris Talley in Toronto called In Your Dreams Freud, which is this big silly musical about Sigmund Freud doing cocaine and hallucinating the trial of Oedipus Rex. Very, very funny comedy. And um, and so when Jill came back to St. John's, she offered the LSPU Hall, uh, offered to do a production of the LSPU Hall as a benefit to the hall. And so we did that in November of 1994. And I was in the show. I played Freud in the show. Um, and that was such a big hit that they wanted to remount it, but the hall had kind of finished their uh, arrangements and kind of said, go, you know, you guys go do the show. And so Jill and the board of directors, um, the board of directors, Jill and the technical crew from that show formed Artistic Fraud of Newfoundland, and they became the first board of directors of that company. Um, so in the first couple of years, I was involved with the company only as a performer. It was formed in 1995. I guess the next year, Jill approached me um, to write a show together. That was the first show that we, we, we had written together, and that was a show called Under Wraps that we did in 1987. Uh, and then that toured for two or three years. Um, and at the end of that touring, around 2000, I became her artistic associate with the company. That was kind of my formal, I think I might have spent like six months on the board of directors at some point as well. But by 2000, I was her, 2000, 2001, I was her artistic associate, so I was kind of officially staffed with the company. And I remained in that role, um, kind of collaborating with her on the artistic vision of the company uh, until she left in 2012 to take on the National Arts Center. And then I took over the artistic vision of the company. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to an aspiring playwright, like someone without any connections yet? Like, how do you get your work produced after you finish writing it? I think the most important thing um, I did. Um, in my, my, my third play, uh, back when I thought I knew everything, um, 
With my third play, I put it I, I put it in a bunch of envelopes and I sent it to every theater in the country. And I, I sat back and I waited and I thought, this play is fantastic. <laughs> it's going to get produced everywhere. And it didn't. Um, and I, what I didn't know then that I know now is that it's, it's pretty atypical for... Um, it's pretty atypical for work to get programmed that way in Canada, and I would say anywhere. Even though a lot of the larger theaters have literary managers and dramaturgs on staff who read a lot of the incoming work, um, theater is about relationships. And I, I wouldn't be as cynical. I won't be as cynical as to say um, uh, it's all about who you know, because that is a very cynical way of looking at it. Uh, a more accurate way to say it is that it's about relationships, and that. Um, if you want a career in theater, uh, then you have to actively pursue those relationships in a way that is, um, in a way that is long term, that is meaningful, that is um, that is not uh, couched in self benefit. And so, what I mean by that is, I would encourage people to go to festivals. I would encourage people to take advantage of those play development centers that I had previously spoke of, like Playwrights Oriented Resource Center, the BAM Center, Playwrights Workshop Montreal, there are others across the country. Um, go to these things, meet the people that are there, make connections, find your community. I was very, very lucky early on that I found my community. I found my collaborators in my early 20s. And I would never have survived in this business if I did not have um, that wonderful supportive team around me all of us kind of moving in the same direction and wanting the same thing. And so I always say to my students that if you really, really want to do this, you can, but the one thing that you need to do is you need to find your collaborators. And I don't mean collaborators like someone to write the play with you. I mean collaborators like find a director that you want to work with that's going to, produce, like going to direct your work. Find a producer that's a good, like someone that enjoys working with money and marketing. Start a theater company. Um, that's how that's how people build careers. There are a couple of writers in Canada that um, that exist purely as like I think of someone like Hannah Moskovich, who's kind of one of our greatest writers right now. You know, she's so busy and she's getting produced everywhere. But even someone like Hannah started off had her own theater company, and the first couple of pieces that she did, she produced under the banner of that theater company in in, in Summerworks, which is a small theater festival in, in Toronto. It's not small; it's a massive theater festival in Toronto. Um, that has provided a great, um, has been a great resource for young and emerging writers and developing writers. Uh, so even Hannah came through that door. Um, there are very few people that uh, exist in a world where they write a play, send it out, and it gets done. Um, and that the true path to building a career for yourself in the arts is one where um, you enjoy the ride, you're patient, uh, you Take, uh, you take and place great value on um, forging those relationships for the sake of having those relationships. And what I mean by that is not going to, the, not going to conventions or festivals and, and playing the cell and trying to market, but actually going to these festivals purely out of a desire to meet your colleagues and develop relationships. And, uh, and we did that for a lot of years. And, and I feel now that uh, not only do I have a, a, a cultural community here in St. John's, but I feel part of a cultural community across the country. Um, but that was a, that was a long, um, a long process of engaging with people uh, for the sake of getting to know them and getting to know what their theaters do and why they do what they do and seeing their work and um, yeah. So patience, patience, and an honest, true engagement with your colleagues and finding your team. That's my best advice. What do you like the most about your job? <clears throat> I set my own hours, which are often very erratic. Um, I get to, for most of my day, I get to use my imagination and creativity in dreaming um, In dreaming of how, um, in, in dreaming up stories and how to tell people stories that can hopefully positively change the world. I, mean, I don't mean to sound too, um, I don't want to sound too naive about that, but I, I you know, I, I, I do see art as an agent for agency of social change, and I think it's, 
it's um, yeah, like I, when I sit down to think about what most of my working day is spent um, being creative and imagining and thinking about impact and thinking about the city I live in and the kind of city I want it to be and the country I live in and the kind of country I want it to be and um, and that is that work can be scary but it's also hugely um, gratifying <laughs> um, it's a uh, it's a job that lets me um, it's a job that lets me work and interact with some really incredible people it's a job that is never um, stationary or static I feel like every week of every month of every year I've been doing this job there's a different thing on my desk and oftentimes I'm not at this desk I'm <laughs> I'm other places in the world and I'm I travel a lot um, so yeah like if you are a person that if you are a person that as I am um, that would find a, a nine to five job in the same office um, every day of every year, if you find that, that idea quite stifling, the arts is the antithesis of that. It's, it's, um, it, it allows you to, um, it allows you a freedom and allows you emotion through the world that, that, uh, that a job like that wouldn't. Now, it also is the antithesis of the stability of that world. You know, I, I never know, um, even with the, the great privilege that I have in my life, I never know what's coming six months to a year out. I never know what's, you know, <laughs> the flashlight is peering into the darkness and I never know what's beyond that darkness. Um, but there's an excitement to that as well. Um, it depends upon what you want out of a job and what you want out of a vocation. Um, and if you want, I often tell people, <clears throat> I have young students coming to me who have an interest in writing, uh, who are craving stability, like they're craving, I have a, a young student come to me who was craving stability at 22, she wanted a house and a car and a kid, and I said, you really, you should really think about having a stable, stable career and income if you want that, because uh, I'm not quite sure that art, um, art might frustrate you in that way, and I don't mean to be talking to people out of a career in arts, but I think it's uh, also quite disingenuous to say to somebody who is at that young age craving that stability and that order um, to tell them go into art is, is, is it's a little bit disingenuous. But if you're a person like me that um, craves adventure and craves change and flux and craves constant learning and craves new relationships and craves all those things, uh, the art is the perfect career for you. Uh, it's the absolute perfect career for you because it's constantly changing, constantly evolving. Every day there's a new problem that's a different problem than the one before. Every day there's a new point of excitement that's a different point of excitement than the day before. Um, so it depends upon your personality and what you're looking at, of, at for a vocation, I think. And what, in your opinion, makes a good playwright? Oh, goodness me. Um, I was going to say there's no short answer to that, but none of the answers I've provided you are short, so I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, my favorite playwrights are writers who, <clears throat> writers who um, understand, this is the most general way I can put it, writers who understand in every way the incredible power to be had of a group of people entering into a room or entering into a space and encountering a transformative narrative together. That's probably the unifying thing for the writers that I like are writers that um, understand what that potency and that power that theater holds and it manifests in their work. And so the work is funny and entertaining and all those things, but it's also um, digging and provoking and um, punching at something that is um, previously unseen or unthought of or under-discussed, um, and they're doing it in a way that is um, fully embracing the liveness of theater, um, that there is... Uh, 
a line of people, a rows of people, four feet away from you, experiencing this thing, and that that uh, the story is an engagement and a sharing with those people, and all the potential that comes with that. So the work that I love and the work that I try to make um, follows along those two lines. Uh, an idea that that. Uh, that through all of the entertainment and all the laughter and all the other things that a lot of people go to the theater for, there's a possibility for transformation for, for an audience member to walk into a room, encounter something live in that room, and leave altered. And that as a writer, as a person, with the theater starts with the writer, uh, that that, uh, that exists within your realm of power to, to, to try to do that. And also that, uh, that it's live and that it's mutating and changing and that the form demands that you embrace that, not just ignore it. And what's the difference between writing your own play from scratch and adaptation? Um, I've done both a lot of those, I've done both of those things a lot. Um, adaptation, it's almost, adaptation is, um, I love doing adaptations. Adaptations are, uh, uh, they're almost technical to start with because the story is there uh, and so they become almost technical in terms of um, what you extract uh, from, from the existing piece uh, to push into the realm of theatre. Uh, and, and embrace the realm of theater, that becomes a technicality of that extraction. It's almost like surgery. Um, I've never said that before, but it's true. It's almost like a, it's almost a surgical kind of precision involved in that, and then you regrow it. It's like you take, take something off of this over here and you put it in a Petri dish and you regrow it. Um, and writing something original is slightly different. It's more gut-based. The technique comes in later once you realize what you have. Um, and so, yeah, they're very, very different processes, but um, the one thing that's common in my work, most of my stuff, is that both with the adaptations and the original pieces I write, is that uh, the original pieces I write are usually based on true stories or existing stories, so that I, I have source material. Either way, with an adaptation, I have the source material of the original piece, and with the real stories, I have the source material of the research. Uh, and I rely heavily on that when I'm when I'm creating the shows. And it's uh, yeah. And with the original piece, it's uh, it's just reading that research and going through everything, massive amounts of material, and trying to find the heart of something, trying to find what might be the kind of beating heart of a play. Uh, and with an adaptation, um, that kind of beating heart is there already. And it's about what parts you can salvage, what parts of it you can move over into this other, uh, other realm in order to preserve what's there. And oftentimes, preserving what's there in adaptation means being really, really uh, cruel with the cuts, like cutting stuff that you love most about. Like I did an adaptation of um, the Colony of Unrequited Dreams, and had to cut my favorite scene from the book because it just didn't have it didn't have a place in the play for many, many reasons it never place in the play. Um, that happens a lot with adaptation. You kind of go, oh, well, it'll definitely preserve this. It's like, no, actually, that is great, but it doesn't belong in this medium. So, yeah, I love doing both, but, um, and I don't know which one is easier either. They both have their inherent challenges, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're somewhat different. And can it be described to me different stages of production, for example, you finish writing the play, mm -hmm. what happens after that and for how long does the play run approximately? Oh, that varies so much. Um, with my stuff, uh, what we've fallen into in the last 10 years or so, the mode of production that we've fallen into the last 10 years or so, and it is only the last 10 years, the company is about 25 years old now, will be in two years, 23 years old. Um, but only in the last 10 years have we fallen into this mode of production where we kind of invest in the long-term development of our pieces. We used to really rush pieces to the stage um, very, very quickly. I'd write a show, we'd be writing a show, and we'd have it up on stage within eight months. Uh, and guess what? The shows weren't very good uh, because they were rushed. And in the last 10 years, we kind of stopped and started to slow down the process a bit. Um, so what our process looks like now, it usually takes about three to four years before something reaches the stage. Um, 
It will start with me writing, uh, researching and writing a first draft, which can take anywhere from a year to two years at the very beginning. And then we'll go through a series of workshops. So um, there'll be, with any given piece of ours, there'll be uh, a text workshop uh, with actors in the room, and we'll read the work, and we'll spend a week on tearing it apart. Um, usually there's music involved in our pieces, so there'll often be a music workshop at some point. Um, through the process, we'll re-engage with the, with the text, but also we'll add music to it, and we'll start thinking about it that way. And then we'll do, uh, so at least one of those, if not two of those each, for each production. Then we'll do uh, either a full production or a workshop production of the show, uh, which means we rehearse it and we put it up on stage and we share it with an audience. Uh, then we bring our dramaturg down to see that show. We bring Sarah in to see that show. And, uh, oh, a motorcycle, perfect timing. Um, I hate those motorcycles so much. Um, so we bring Sarah down to see the show. She'll see the show in production, and then we'll re-engage with the show after production. Because our shows are created here when we create them to tour. Um, so Sarah will come and see the show, then we'll have a post-production, what we call a post-production workshop, where we'll look at the videotapes of the show, we'll re-engage with the, the whole thing, including lights and sound, the whole design element, and we'll start fixing it. Fixing it. Uh, and so the next time we go into rehearsal, uh, the piece is evolved. And, um, and yeah, and we'll continue that process for as long as the show has a uh, living life. Like a show like Oil & Water, for example, we did in 2011, the premiere production, and then we started touring it in 2012, and it toured for three years. And each of those three years that we went back to tour it, we'd re-engage with the production. Like there's actually the final production that we did in 2014 is so different from the original production we did in 2011. So different. Um, because we kept refining, 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 and we actually got it right, I think. But that's that's what our process looks like. Um, yeah, and that process is not the process that everyone shares. A lot of writers are in a world where they will go through a development process and workshops, but once the show is produced, that often is the end of the line. A lot of productions don't get to tour, and a lot of shows don't get a second production. So a playwright can work for two to three years on a play, and then the play is produced for three weeks, and then that's the end of the line for the play, and maybe it gets published and it has a life, or it gets another production somewhere out there in the world, but the playwright usually has walked away from it, and um, that's the end of their kind of engagement with the piece as a piece of writing. Uh, I tend to have a much longer life with my plays as they go through touring, we refine, refine, refine which I'm also very grateful for. Yeah. And what do you do as an artistic director of this company? As an artistic director of the company, I, um, I program the work, so I essentially make the decisions about, um, I essentially make the decisions about what plays we're going to create, um, how we're going to create them. Um, I consult heavily with Jill, who's the director on the pieces, in terms of who the personnel are going to be, both the actors and the design personnel on the shows. Um, I consult, I, I do a lot of work with Pat in terms of marketing the work and, and, and how we get people actually out to see the shows and what the, what the, um, the actual um, the media interface of the show is, like what it looks like on a website, what posters look like, how the heart of the piece kind of bleeds through that work, because that's really, really important to me. I think oftentimes the first impression that people get of a piece of theatre is a website or a poster, ironically, through the visual arts, is the first impression they get of a piece of theater. So uh, I have a lot of input on that. Um, and a lot of visioning. We constantly go back at this company. We constantly are uh, having conversations about uh, what the company is and why the company is and what we're trying to do and what we're trying to do for the city and the province and the country and how we can best do it. Uh, and so on top of the work that myself and Jill do, there's a whole other side of the company, the function of the company that's still evolving, that is about um, outreach and development of other artists and outreach into underrepresented communities and affording those kind of opportunities to people. So all of that stuff, visioning stuff is happening with me and Pat. I never work alone. <laughs> as a writer or as an artistic director, uh, the whole thing is a very, very collaborative affair. Um, Nothing ever starts or ends with me. I don't know if that's good or not, but it's true. Yeah. I have mentioned the creative writing program in Guelph, I think. Yeah. How do you 
find balance between everything, artistic director, playwright, going back to university? <laughs> like any advice on time management? Well, you know, I, I, uh, that's a good question. I, uh, I, when I applied to do that program, um, I was there to stick associate of this company. And so I applied to that program and I said to Jill, uh, who was there to stick director of the company at the time, I said, I'm going to take a couple of years to go away and do my master's. I really want to focus on this. Because my plan really was to do fiction, so I thought I was going to write, a, and I did. I wrote a book of short stories. I thought I'm going to go away for two years and write a book of short stories, and so I'm going to, you know. And at that point, uh, like my show All in Water was happening, and there was another play that I was just about finishing development called The Color of Ron Carter Dreams that we were beginning to do. So uh, the company's work was kind of shored up for a while. And I thought I'm going to go away and do this, and I think I was there for a couple months, and then Jill got a call that she got the National Arts Center. So my plan to take a couple of years to go away and do this. From for me, uh, got upended a little bit, and all of a sudden, not only was I doing my master's degree, I was running a company, and, and yeah, so um, it was fine. I actually found it incredibly an energizing time, um, but I also find like it reminded me in a, in a similar way. It reminds me, you know, when I teach at the university here, um, that that becomes an added extra thing to your workload. You know, that you're that you're teaching every week, and that you're reading all these student plays and stuff. But what's miraculous about it, even though it's eating, you know, 20 hours of your week every week, um, it's actually hugely energizing. It's hugely inspiring. And I found that at school, too, um, that even though I was, you know, I was running this company down here and trying to create the work and stuff, but being in that environment with those writers, those other writers that I was working with in that program was hugely inspiring. And so I actually felt like I had more time and more... Um, more focused energy to bring to my work than, than probably at any other period uh, I can remember. Yeah, and I was also living, there's something to be said as well, like my working life now, and like I'm a single guy, like I don't have a I don't have, live with a like I live in my house by myself, which is, so you'd think that I have a lot of time to write, but it's really quite miraculous. I actually have to separate myself from the city in order to get any writing done. Because I, and I can't even like I can't even give you an example of the stuff that happens. But if I was at my house and said I'm going to lock myself in my house for a week to write, I would promise you four of those five days would get taken away by stuff just because I'm in the city. Uh, appointments, little things, errands that I end up having to run or people would ask me to do. So when I write now, like I, I have a couple of uh, friends and benefactors who give me their out of town homes and I go and stay out there for a week or two weeks and I write, and that's the only way I can get the writing done anymore. And when I was in Toronto, uh, that was happening for a year and a half because I was living in Toronto. I wasn't here. So I really was completely focused on the work. And uh, yeah, that rarely happens anymore. I have to actually separate myself and go somewhere out in the city, turn off my phone to do it. Yeah. Do you have any rituals, any customs? Uh, No, that feels like it changes all the time, too. One thing that I usually do... Um, one thing that I usually do for every uh, every project, or like on my iTunes, I have, a, I have a playlist for every project. I'll go through my... Every time I'm starting a project, one of the first things I will do is I'll go through all of my songs, my playlist, all of my songs on my iTunes library, and compile songs that fit the... Um, the lyrical and or tonal quality of what I think I'm trying to create. So I'll create a, a playlist so that if I'm in the middle of um, despairing or not, not feeling particularly motivated, just putting on this music brings me back to uh, at least the center of where I thought I was, the thing I was trying to circle. It will bring me back into the world of it a little bit. Uh, so for example, when I was working up between breaths, um, I had like a whole playlist of songs about, and very few of them were about whales, but all about water and all about dying. And so I could never get too far away from the kind of spirit of the thing. Cause I, you know, whenever I'd walk away, I'd put this music on and it would constantly drag me back. I know writers do a lot of that kind of thing. I know writers that do a lot of, and I tried this and it's never worked for me. Um, writers that do that visually, that kind of go and pull images and put images all over there. Um, that's never worked for me. Um, it's never, I've never found that particularly inspiring, but the music thing has really worked out for me, I have to say. It's one of the only things I do. That and actually separating myself, going and locking myself away. Um, 
yeah, that seems to work well when I can actually get out of the city. Is there anything you would like to talk about? I don't know. We've talked about a lot, haven't we? Um, no, I mean, I guess, I guess, the thing with the thing, I, uh, the last thing I would say about playwriting is, I think playwriting is one of the. I've only met a couple of people in my life that that wanted to be playwrights. <laughs> that you know, it's true, and uh, even the, uh, a lot of the writers, like professional writers I know in the country. There's very few of them that were in high school and wanted to be playwrights. Because uh, to be frank, like not a lot of us, not a lot of us, a not a lot of us think about playwrights. When we encounter the theater, we're thinking about the actors. Like that's what we're, we're thinking about. The, you know, most of us, ninety nine percent of us, when we go to a theater show, are thinking about the craft of acting because that's what we're seeing. None of us are thinking about the craft of how the story came to be or the craft of this. Some of us are sure, but so I think that's part of it. But I think. Also, it's a it's a it's a kind of um, it's a mysterious career. We never really think about it as a career. And so, all the writers that I know, most of the writers I know, came to it um, almost by accident. Um, and so, I guess if you're a person, <laughs> if you're a person who likes theater, if you're a person who um, likes story and likes theater, try playwriting. Because I tried playwriting. I had no idea I had an aptitude for it or that it would result in what's happened to me. But um, try playwriting. I run a course at Memorial University. Come, do my course. It's totally painless. Particularly the uh, introductory course. It's totally painless and really fun. And um, try it. Because I see students over and over and over again um, come into my class, I, there was, like, uh, the poets, the poets that come to my class are extraordinary playwrights. And you wouldn't think that because the forms are so different. Uh, but I see people coming to my class all the time just to kind of dip their toe in and check it out. Uh, and some people really surprise themselves. Kind of one of my, you know, um, uh, the, the kind of person that, you know, I, I, I keep thinking about when I have these conversations is Megan Gale Coles, who is, uh, you know, my favorite Newfoundland playwright right now. She's a tremendous playwright, and she, um, I, I ran a workshop through Artistic Fraud back in 2004, and I put out a call to the community of people of writers to come in and do this workshop. And everybody that applied, I knew except for this woman, Meg Coles, and she submitted prose. She didn't know anything about playwriting. She submitted a, sh a short story. And it was so alive and funny and dark, and it was just awesome. I just loved the writing of it. And I thought, yeah, okay. And the, and the, and this like it was to send send me in a play that you want to work on. And she didn't have a play to send, it, so she sent in a short story. And she came in, and you know, and she did that workshop with me, uh, and it was great. And and then she ended up becoming a playwright, not because of me, but there was there was something there was something that was in her that was made for it. And that when she encountered the other writers in that that group, and when she um, was in a position where she allowed herself to be in a position to try that form of writing, there's something that unlocked in her that was there. And, uh, and she ended up going to National Theatre School, and she's a tremendous writer. But I think a lot of people are like that. It's um, There are people that write in other forms, or they're actors, or they're... Uh, they, they give it a try and suddenly they found this incredible aptitude for it. So I would encourage people to try it. And the last question, what's the best advice you have been given? The best advice I've been given? I've been given a lot of good advice. Um, That's a good question. It feels like a really serious question too. Like I want to make sure it's the very, very best advice I was ever given. Um, I tell this story a lot. 
um, it's not really advice, but it's a, a thing that a colleague said to me one time that is true. I was very, um, I was very uh, uh, angry, upset, or um, discontent. At one point in my life, I felt that the work from Newfoundland was ignored uh, in Toronto and bigger centers. And that kind of irritated me in a way. And, and I was at a festival and I was um, kind of shooting my mouth off about this a little bit, about, you know, no one here cares about what's happening in Newfoundland. Anyway, I shooting my mouth off about this a little bit. And, and there was this lovely, lovely guy who shall remain nameless. Uh, okay, his name is Andy McKim, and he's just resigning from Theodore Passamurai. And Andy's a prince of a man. He's uh, a gorgeous fella. And Andy, um, at that point, was working at the Tarragon Theatre. I'll never forget this. We were at a bar, and I was talking a little bit about this, because we were talking about regionalism and regional representative, representation at this festival. And I was com kind of complaining about how the work was so Toronto-centric, or I don't know what I was getting on with. Anyway, and Andy uh, kind of paused and kind of very gently said, oh, it's really disappointing to hear you say that, because I, I, and we were in Edmonton. He said, I, I, flew, I flew to Edmonton specifically to see your play, <laughs> which was deeply embarrassing. Uh, but I remember that, and he didn't—he didn't say it to embarrass me. He was he said it in the most gentle way. And he's a gentle guy, a total gentleman. Uh, but I remember that, um, and it really, really changed me. That little moment, whether Andy knows that or not, it really changed me. But that moment made me realize that, um, both personally and professionally, uh, it is to your great detriment to make assumptions about. Uh, what other people think and feel <laughs> about you, about your work, or anything else. It is great detriment. Um, you are essentially putting up obstacles for yourself when you make choices about those kind of things. Um, and it will benefit you, both personally and professionally, in your life if you encounter um, people or um, people or events that are problematic, uh, it will benefit you greatly that until you're proven otherwise to assume that they are problematic, them being problematic has nothing to do with you. <laughs> does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. So if you encounter someone who is uh, not particularly pleasant to you, uh, it will benefit you to make the choice to decide that there is something going on in that person's life that has nothing to do with you until proven otherwise. Um, and I took that away from what Andy um, said that day because I, it turns out I was feeling a lot of um, resentment and discontentment about nothing <laughs> you know so um, yeah and, and you know and it's it's something that I uh, I realize as well like it's a very vulnerable thing to be an artist it's a very vulnerable thing to I constantly head to my students like oh you know you have to think about putting your most vulnerable things on the page and sharing them with the world and then you put them out in the world and then your friends come see them and the critics come see them and you get a bad review in the paper or somebody you really like and respect that you really want to like your work kind of comes and kind of waves across the, the room and leaves without saying anything to you and you kind of go home and you spiral into this like oh they hated it and they hate me and and it can be a very very precarious precarious thing if you give into that um, it can be really detrimental to your professional and personal life if you give into that too much and you need to uh, find a way to find a way to trust uh, in your heart that uh, yeah that not everything's about you <laughs> all right thank you very much you're this welcome is, uh, the interview. <laughs>